Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all for that warm welcome. Judging by the applause, it sounds like my checks to the annual fund have, have rated to your schools, so that's a relief for me. Leading with why. Why is a monosyllabic three-letter word that at one on one side can be extremely simple, beautiful, and innocent, and on the other side can be incredibly complex and at times frustrating. Allow me to demonstrate. <clears throat> it's a spring day. John and his son Billy are outside. It's a beautiful day. Sun is shining. The sky is an incredible shade of Carolina blue. And they're having a conversation, much like a father and a son would have a conversation. And it goes something like this. Dad, why is the sky blue? Well, Billy, the sky's blue because that's how God intended it to be. Um, okay, but why? Well, God's all-knowing, so he knew people would enjoy the color blue. Um, okay, but why? Just because, Billy. Okay. A second passes, and Billy says, But Dad, why? Billy, just go ask your mother. We all know how that scenario plays out. What I love about why, it has this really cool dichotomy to it. On the one side, you have why exclamation point. It's a statement. This is what I believe. And on the other side, you have why question mark. As a clarification tool, why can be incredibly revealing if used with proper technique. What I've learned from 18 years in doing ed tech change in schools is that there's challenge in change. And every single change initiative has a different set of challenges that come with it. But what I love is that when you learn to use the power of why and the duality that it brings to you as a leader, you can really change things in your schools. So why, why? I know it's a little bit ironic, but how did I get to this point? Well, when I look back upon my career and uh, books that I've read and research that I've read, uh, you see a number of them up here on the screen. Um, Hal and Locks were folks that did research on change in the 1970s. Les McKeon wrote The Synergist which is about um, personality types and how they come into play in organizations. Seth Godin, we all know Seth Godin, but Lynchpin and Tribes were two big reads for me. Um, the Heath Brothers, Switch, How Change, um, How You Can Change When Change is Hard. But the two books that really kind of brought me to leading with why and also ending with why were Simon Sinek's Start With Why and Eric Ries' The Lean Startup. Now, The Lean Startup might be not a book that you might normally gravitate to, but you'll see why it worked for me in a second. Cynic says in Start With Why that most organizations know what they do and how they do it, but very few of them know why they do what they do. He says you need to flip that on its head. He calls it the golden circle, and you have to take why and put it in the middle, and I like to think of that as the heart of what we do. Eric Ries in Lean Startup talks about BML, which is build, measure, learn. He says a lot of times software companies will go out there and they'll build a product and they'll build it with all the bells and whistles they possibly can. And what they find is that's not what customers need. So he says, do an MVP, a minimal viable product. Start small, build something, measure it, get feedback and learn from it. And he uses a series of uh, iterations called the five whys. He says, you can get to the heart of any matter by using why as a question until you get to, to, the, to the base level of what's wrong. So I kind of took all of these and thrown it together, and a light bulb went off. We really should be leading with why in all that we do. Here's an example of what it looks like when you lead with what. So I'm a chief information officer. Uh, I run a number of different uh, departments at my school, but one of them uh, happens to be the tech support team. And if they led with what, it may sound like this. 
We provide hardware and software support when you need it. We have a help desk email or a hotline number that you can call. We're here to help. Not very inspiring, right? When you're having issues or trouble, you want somebody to speak to your heart. You want them to know what you're going through. Um, if I called a company that had that as their tagline, it may go something like this. You've reached company XYZ. Thank you for calling tech support. Your business is important to us. Please remain on the line until the next agent is available. Your approximate wait time is as long as it took Microsoft to beat Apple. Okay, that hasn't happened, so who wants to be on hold for that long? Not me. It didn't speak to my heart. I don't want to deal with that company. So I might hop on Twitter and say, company XYZ, worst tech support ever, hashtag epic fail. If I flip it and I start with why, it may sound a little bit more like this. In everything we do, we believe in being patient, helpful, and kind. We believe in giving you the benefit of the doubt. We give you the benefit of the doubt by listening to you like it's the very first time we've heard your question or problem. We really listen to help bring a solution. We just happen to provide great technical support. Need help? Give us a call or email us. That's a company that gets me, right? That's an organization that speaks to my heart. I might hop onto Twitter at that point and go, company ABC has the best tech support ever. Hardy Modicon, hashtag, they get me. Hardy Modicon. That's the basis of leading with why. There's a phrase that goes, winning hearts and minds, which was, uh, oddly enough, was, came about in time of war to solve war and conflict. And who are we kidding? Those of us who are change agents in our schools are battling in the trenches every single day. But I like the phrase, winning hearts and minds. I fully believe that if you set out to win the heart first, you can eventually win the mind. But if you set out solely to win the mind, you will never win the heart. And as we all know, the heart always gets what the heart wants. Right? That goes back to switch. Dan and Chip Heath were talking about a rider and an elephant. And the rider is the logical part of our brain. And the elephant is the heart. And on most days, the rider can get the elephant to go where he wants it to go. But on that day where the elephant whiffs a scent of peanuts and it's over here and I want to go over there, there is no way the rider's getting the elephant to go that way. It's all about what's in here. So what's my story? How did I get to be here today? Well, first, I have to apologize to you. My talk is entitled, Lead With Why? How EdTech Leaders can inspire change, and that's a misprint. It's a fabrication, it's a lie, it's whatever you want to call it. This talk is not just for ed tech leaders. And it's not just for quote unquote leaders either. This talk, Lead With Why, is for anyone in any organization anywhere in the world. I fully believe that anyone can inspire change in their organization regardless of their role, regardless of your role, Everyone can make change in their organization. So my story, where does it begin? 1996. At the time, I had been doing admissions in a number of schools, and I was working at Trinity Pauling School in Pauling, New York, and I was the Associate Director of Admissions. Uh, I tinkered with tech a little bit. I had installed the school's first online card catalog, and people were starting to ask me questions about technology. Oh, how do you do this in Word? Or can you come check out my computer? And if anybody can harken back to those days, if you knew anything about technology in 1996, you were the tech director. Now, in my case, it was a little bit more of this idealistic volunteerism. Hey, let me investigate this for the school. And the next thing I know, you know, the trumpets coronate and the flag goes up and good luck, you're the tech director. But I was okay with that. So I started to search. I started to search for how I could learn about technology in schools. And oddly enough, when I'm getting ready to prepare for July 1997 to become the school's first director of technology, the New York State Associate, Association of Independent Schools had a technology conference, conference uh, for technology tech directors. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, what are there going to be like four people there? I mean, it's 1996. How many schools have technology? 
Believe it or not, it was a packed house. It was at Mohonk Mountain House. Everybody been to Mohonk to go to a conference? Anybody? Gorgeous place, right? Top of a mountain, lake, Victorian house. Clear your mind, you get focused. So there I am with, no, no laptops back then, pads and pads of papers and plenty of pens because you know the ink runs out in those things. And I'm focused and, and I'm learning about the emerging role of technology in schools. And I do still have my notes, Word 95. I looked them up for this presentation. And as I went back to look through them, I saw a lot of what and how. What and how. What is the role of technology in schools? How do we get teachers to integrate technology into the curriculum? What's the best professional development program to get our teachers to do technology in the classroom? You know, if 1996 wasn't on, on that slide, you could have sworn we had that conversation last month, last week, on the car ride over here. We're too focused on what we do and how we do it. Did I leave that conference energized? Absolutely. That's what coming together as peers will do for us. Did I leave inspired? Maybe not so much. But I don't think I knew better either. At that time, we were all focused on what technology was and how we were going to get it into our schools. And that's okay. So if you go back again to the subtitle of my talk, how ed tech leaders can inspire change, we've already thrown out the notion that it's for ed tech leaders. We've already thrown out the notion that it's for quote unquote leaders. So this talk really becomes about how to inspire change in your organizations. When you think about people who inspire change, who comes to mind? What do they look like? What have they done? When was the last time you felt inspired at your organization? When was the last time someone inspired you to change? Here are a couple that came to mind when I was putting together this talk. What's the common thread with all of those folks? Everyone who came across that screen, and I'm sure you can think of countless others and organizations that help uh, feed the homeless or provide education to children or help wounded vets who have come back from war. Lots of people come to mind in organizations, but what makes them so inspiring? What makes them so noble in their actions? I can guarantee you it wasn't that they went out and told you what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. That was secondary. No, they led with why. This is why I believe we need to make this change. This is why my cause is important. This is why I believe in what I believe. They did not lead with what and how. So where does that leave us? Looking inside of ourselves. Why don't we see ourselves as inspirational change leaders? Is it because there's not enough hours in the day? Probably. The faculty won't listen to us? Possibly. Right? I don't know how to get them to change their minds. There's lots of factors that go into why we don't see ourselves as inspirational change leaders, and also lots of factors that can inhibit us from moving forward with change in our schools. But if you lead with why, you will make a difference, because you will speak to the heart. The reason we often don't find ourselves having great success with change in schools is because we don't an answer the fundamental question of change why. Why should I change? Why is this good for me? Why is this important to me? Hal and Locks, the two researchers I mentioned earlier from the 1970s who, who studied change, said that change is a process it's not an event. It is highly personal. It involves developmental growth in feelings and skills. And it's made by individuals first and then institutions. Process, it's not going to happen overnight. Made by individuals first. Developmental growth in feelings and skills. Sounds a lot like we should be talking to the heart and not the mind when we're trying to lead change initiatives in our schools. 
we have to answer the question, why should I change? Why is this good for me? Why is it good for kids? Why is it good for the institution? So where does my story continue? So you jump forward 14 years, which, by the way, is my lucky number prior to this conversation. 14 was good. Um, jump forward to 2010. And it's the spring, and I'm meeting with department chairs, and we're having a conversation about technology in our school. And I'm trying to get a sense of, you know what, this BYOD thing is happening. I didn't really want to go iPad. I didn't really want to go Macs or PC laptops. I just, I just wasn't feeling it at that time. So I'm thinking, all right, well, BYOD may be a good way to enter this space, because we, we didn't have a one-to-one -one program at the time. And so I talked to the department chairs about possibly doing BYOD in the fall of 2010. And the department chairs immediately go to what and how. What, what's that going to look like? How are we going to keep the kids safe? What are we going to put in place for policies for how they use it? How are we going to block websites? At that point in time, I realized I needed to switch gears and go over to why. So I told them, you know, the SGA had been talking to me about needing the ability to do their work anywhere, anytime. It's for the kids. That's why we need to move forward with BYOD. We also have too many crowded labs and not enough time for people to use them. Still, the faculty was stuck in this what and how. So I took it and I put it in a Ziploc bag and I kind of put it over here to marinate later. So we come back in the fall of 2010 and we're having another department chair meeting and I'm listening to the conversations and they're back in the swing of things a little bit and they start to say, oh, I'd really love 20 computers over here. I need 20 computers in my classroom. I need 10 down here and five over there. So then I go to the questioning of why, and I say, well, why? Well, there's a lot of great resources out there on the web, and we really want to work with the kids right in our class. We don't want to have to book the lab. Well, why don't you want to have to book the lab? Well, it's always booked. I can't get in. All right, and what's another reason? Well, we feel like we could do a lot more with the kids. So I kind of get to the heart of the matter there, and I say to them, you know what? You're really talking about one-to-one. -one. And they kind of looked around, and they let it sink in for a second, and they said, you know what, you're right. It would be helpful if every kid had a device, and we could use it right in our classroom, anytime, anywhere. Now, it was the start of school in 2010. We weren't quite ready for that. So we flipped forward to 2011, and um, the BYOD program just was horrendous. It didn't work. It was an epic fail. The kids who um, brought, already were bringing laptops were like, yes, thank you so much for giving us Wi-Fi, and nobody else brought anything. But the English department at the time was ready to try something. And so Brian Kelly, who I think is here, was part of that for us. And we rolled it out, and they started to use it. And the next thing we know, we were rolling out a, um, a beta program for kids in grades 7 and 10, and then fully Chromebook 1 to 1 um, in 2012-13. All because I led with why and finished with why. So looking back, what's my advice to you? It's simple. First, everyone in this room needs to see themselves as inspirational change leaders. Second, lead every project or idea with why. Third, end every project with the iterations of why so that you can do the process better the next time. And fourth, always seek to win the heart first and the mind second. And above all else, remember what Peter Dr Drucker once said. He said, if you want to predict the future, go and create it. I say, if you lead with why, the future you predict will take care of itself. And if everything else goes wrong and all else fails and you have nowhere else to turn, just go ask your mother. Thank you.